What's good everyone? This is Manaro and welcome to my channel. Today we're going to cover chapters 19 to 25. Hope you enjoy. From high in a tree, Arya can see a fishing village with some smoking chimneys. It is the first sign of life since they fled the whole fast. The Lannisters have burned or killed everything. The houses promise warmth and shelter unless it is Sir Armory Lorch there. Arya watches for a long time, trying to be sure, but it is too far to see for certain. Arya and the others waited until the next night to return to the burnt village. Hot Pie and Lamy were still afraid, but Lorch and his men were long gone. The whole fast was strewn with corpses from both sides, and scavengers had been at them. One look was enough for Gendry, but Arya insisted they find Yorin, telling herself he could not be dead. They found his body next to four Lannister men-at-arms, and Arya wondered how many men it took to bring the Black Brother down. There were too many bodies to bury everyone, but Arya insisted Yorin must have a grave. As they dug, part of her wanted to cry, and part of her wanted to kick Yorin. The only other survivors were Cutjack, Kurz, and Tarber, who had been on lookout in the tower house. They came under attack as well, but the stone tower was inflammable and inaccessible with the ladder pulled up, so Lorch's men left them. When Kurz decided they would be better continuing north, Arya clung to the hope of still reaching Winterfell, but Kurz took an arrow in the shoulder, pulling up the tower house ladder, and despite Tarber treating it with mud and moss, the wound festered and killed him. Soon after, Tarber and Kajak had taken the dead poacher's weapons and hunting horn when they abandoned them. Afterward, wanting no part of any roads, Arya and the others made their way up the muddy shore of God's Eye, taking turns carrying Lamy on a makeshift litter since the spear wound in his calf is now so bad he cannot walk. From her tree, Arya sees the air over the village is full of crows, but 30 yards from shore, three black swans glide serenely over the water, oblivious to the war. Part of Arya wants to be one of them, but the other part wants to eat one. She and the others have been living mostly on awful tasting acorn paste Kurz taught them to make. Though Arya and Weasel, their name for the crying girl, have been eating bugs and worms. Arya even tried catching fish with her hands as Kost once did, but without success. Beneath Arya's tree, Hot Pie barks like a dog to signal her, an old poacher's trick Kurz taught them. With the nimbleness of a water dancer, Arya returns to the ground to report her findings. Hot Pie opines that they should go to the village and ask for food, convinced they will not be killed if they yield. Gendry accuses him of sounding like Lamy, who has talked of little else since they escaped from the whole fast. Lamy and Hot Pie insist Lorsch would have left them alone if Yorin had yielded, but Gendry points out that knights and lordlings only take each other captive and do not care about the lower classes. Hapai and Lamy started talking about searching for dead fish, cooking crows, and even hunting boars, which Arya knows they cannot do without boar spears, horses, and men, until Gendry proposes they steal food from the village after he scouts it out. Arya argues that she should go instead because she is stealthier, but Gendry only agrees that she can come with him. Hot Pie and Lamy worry about being left for the wolves, and Lamy whines that they should yield to whoever they find because he needs some potion for his wounded leg. Gendry reminds them that Lamy has a spear for the wolves and promises to bring back any leg portion they find, then dons his bull helm and walks off. During their walk, Gendry stops and says he thinks Lamy is going to die. Arya is not surprised since she felt Lamy's warm skin and smelled the stink of his leg. She suggests finding a maester, but Gendry dismisses it as unlikely. He suggests they should abandon Lamy since Lamy would do the same and he is sick of Lamy's talk of yielding, adding that Arya is the only one who's good for anything, even if she is a girl. Arya panics and insists she is not a girl, but Gendry insists he is not stupid and to prove him wrong she will have to pull out her cock. Desperate to escape the subject, Arya brings up the gold cloaks at the inn and says Gendry is also hiding something. Gendry insists he does not know why they wanted him and turns the question back on Arya, asking why she thought they were after her. Realizing her pretense is done, Arya decides she must kill Gendry or trust him, and after pleading that Lamy and Hot Pie cannot know, she admits she is Arya of House Stark. 
Gendry is so shocked by the revelation that Arya is a highborn lady that he becomes unsure on how to act around her and begins calling her Milady and begging her pardon for talking about Cox and for pissing in front of her. Unsure if he is mocking her, Arya orders him to stop it since even Hot Pie will notice if he starts calling her that. When Gendry responds by calling her Milady again, Arya slams into his chest and he falls down laughing. Then she gives him a kick in the side, which only makes him laugh harder, and sets off for the village, leaving Gendry to hurry after. As they approach the village, they smell rotting flesh. Gendry decides to circle around to the west while Arya continues up the shore, slipping from bush to bush and stopping every few yards to listen. The smell gets worse as she gets closer and she begins to hear horses and men. Squirming through a gap in a bramble thicket on the edge of the village, Arya discovers a long gibbet full of corpses so decayed they hardly look like people. Arya forces herself to look at each one in turn, telling herself she is hard as a stone. Beyond the gibbet, two spearmen guard the doors of the slate roof warehouse by the water. Arya cannot make out the two limp banners nearby, but she knows the dead men must mean Lannisters. The two guards turn toward a shout from a third man, who appears shoving along a prisoner Arya recognizes as Gendry by his bull helm. One of the guards snatches Gendry's helm, and after beating him around a little, they shove him through the heavy doors of the storehouse. From inside, Arya hears sobbing and a loud shriek of pain. Then the wind flutters the banners, and she makes out Lannister Lion and three black dogs on a yellow field that she feels she should remember. Arya watches for hours as the armored men come and go, as dinner is prepared and as night falls, but she does not see an opportunity to free Gendry. Late at night, she returns to the others to insist Hot Pie help her free Gendry. Hot Pie insists they cannot fight 20 soldiers, but Arya argues they will only have to kill the two guards at the storehouse. Lamy suggests they should yield or just leave Gendry, but Arya points out they need his help to carry Lamy. When Arya insists she is going back to try, Hot Pie reluctantly agrees to come along. As they are crawling along under the gibbet, a crow lands on Hot Pie's back and the guards hear his gasp. Hot Pie immediately leaps up and shouts out that he yields. By the time Arya bounces up and draws needle, they are surrounded. She slashes at the nearest man, but he knocks her with a steel clad arm and someone else knocks her to the ground. A third man wrenches Needle away and punches her with his armored fist when she tries to bite him. Disoriented, Arya lies hurting and shamed by the loss of Needle, which Jon Snow gave her and Stereo Forel taught her to use. When she is yanked to her knees, Arya finds herself facing the biggest man she has ever seen and suddenly she remembers the banners with the three dogs. At the hand's tourney, Sansa told her it was the banner of the Hound's brother, Sir Gregor Clegane the mountain that rides, who is even bigger than Hodor. After Hot Pie yields some more and tells him about Lamy and Weasel, Sir Gregor orders them to lead his men there and walks off. As they walk back to where Lamy and Weasel are hiding, Hot Pie promises to make pies and tarts for the four soldiers if they do not hurt him. When they arrive, Lamy immediately yields and explains that Weasel ran off when she heard them coming. The soldiers ask Lamy where they can find Beric Dondarrion, but Lamy has never heard the name. One of the guards declares it is a waste of time since Arya's group do not know any more than the villagers. A spearman drifts over to Lamy and asks if he can walk. When Lamy says they will have to carry him, the spearman replies, Think so? and casually drives a spear through Lamy's soft throat. Tyrion is glad he took the advice to dress warmly, despite looking like a ball of striped fur bundled up in his shadow skin cloak. Deep under Rainey's Hill, the chill in the dank vaults behind the guild hall of the alchemist is so bone deep that even Timmet retreated after a brief taste. By the light of a sealed lamp, Tyrion inspects a fragile grapefruit shaped clay jar. The jar has a pebble texture to keep it from slipping when grasped and when Tyrion tilts it to peer inside the murky green wildfire oozes towards the lip. When Tyrion remarks on its thickness, the pallid and obsequious pyromancer Hallen explains that the substance, as the pyromancers call it, flows more easily as it warms. Tyrion is annoyed by the alchemist's pretentiousness. Their habits of calling each other wisdom 
and hinting at vast stores of secret knowledge do not match the reality of a declining guild in moth-eaten robes who no longer even pretend to transmute metals. The maesters of the Citadel have supplanted the once powerful guild in almost every respect except the creation of wildfire, which remains a closely guarded guild secret. Hallen explains that once kindled, wildfire cannot be quenched and will seep into cloth, wood, leather, or even steel and set them on fire as well. Tyrion recalls from the flaming sword of Thoros of Mir that even a thin coat can burn for an hour, though it ruins the sword. When Tyrion asks why the wildfire doesn't seep into the clay pots, Hallen explains that it does, and thus they have a lower vault full of pots from the reign of King Ares the second Targaryen whose fancy it was to shape the jars like fruit. By rights, those jars should be destroyed, but so many of the guild's master were killed during the sack of King's Landing that they lacked the skill and have flooded the vaults instead. Hallen adds that the whereabouts of much of King Aerys' stock was also lost, such as a cache of 200 jars discovered only last year under the Great Sept of Baelor. Hallen admits this older stock can still be used, but urges extreme caution since wildfire grows more volatile with age and will self-ignite if left in even direct sunlight for too long, causing it to expand violently and create a chain reaction among nearby jars. When Tyrion asks how many jars they have, Hallen quotes the morning's count by Wisdom Munster as 7,840 jars, including 4,000 from King Aerys' older stock and says he is confident the guild will meet its promise of 10,000 jars. Tyrion is astonished, delighted, and terrified. He knows creating wildfire is a lengthy and dangerous process, and thought the number was only a wild boast. He insists he does not want any undue haste or defective wildfire, but Hallen assures him the wildfire is prepared only by trained alkalites in work cells designed to fill with sand and smother any fires and the hapless alkalite. Tyrion is interested in inspecting how such a cell would work, but he does not have time. Hallen reiterates the importance of handling wildfire with care, suggesting that common soldiers in the frenzy of battle may not be as considerate as trained pyromancers, and any little mistake could be catastrophic. In response, Tyrion requests as many spare jars as possible to be delivered to each of the city gates. As they walk back, Hallen stresses the honor of welcoming the hand of the king for the first time since Lord Rossart, who was of their guild himself. The mention of Rossart reminds Tyrion of the stories of Mad King Aerys II using the alchemist to burn his enemies, and he decides it would be best to keep Joffrey well away from the pyromancers to prevent him from getting the same idea. As such, when Hallen promises hosting a feast for Joffrey, Tyrion explains that Joffrey has forbidden feasting at Tyrion's insistence until the war is won. However, Tyrion has no objections when Hallen instead proposes a demonstration of the dread secrets of his ancient order at the Red Keep. There is no harm in a few magic tricks. After navigating the twists and turns of the guild hall, they come to the long and echoing gallery of the Iron Torches where columns of wildfire flames burn around black metal columns and reflect off the black marble walls to bathe the hall in emerald light. However, Tyrion is less impressed because he knows the cost of wildfire means the torches have been lit only to impress him. After bidding farewell to Hallen on the doorstep, Tyrion descends the broad steps to the street of sisters near Vicinia's hill, where Timid waits with his litter and an escort of burned men, a most appropriate escort for a visit to the pyromancers and a necessary precaution since Joffrey rained arrows on a hungry mob at the gates of the Red Keep only three days past. Tyrion is surprised to find Bronn waiting as well with two messages. Sir Jaslyn Bywater urgently requires Tyrion at the gates of the gods and Cersei commands him to attend her in her chambers. Tyrion decides to see Bywater first, as the man is not prone to waste his time and forcing Cersei to wait will make her angry and stupid, which he prefers to composed and cunning. The normally busy food market inside the Gate of the Gods is nearly deserted as Tyrion crosses it to meet Sir Jaslyn, who informs him that Sir Cleos Frey has arrived with peace terms from Robb Stark. Tyrion is pleased, but Cleo proves reluctant to discuss the terms since his orders are to deliver them directly to Cersei. 
Gaunt and haggard from his journey, Cleos describes the dire situation around the God's Eye and the King's Road, where the river lords are burning their own crops to starve the Lannisters, who are in turn torching every village and killing the small folk. Tyrion dismisses this as the way of war, while Cleos adds that even with a peace banner, his party was attacked twice by broken men, losing three men and another six wounded. When Tyrion is amused by Rob's impossible terms, Cleo shares that Rob sits idle at Riverrun, likely afraid to face Lord Tywin in battle, and grows weaker as the River Lords disperse to defend their lands. Tyrion wonders if that was his father's plan, then informs Cleos that the terms, including the exchange of Willem Lannister and Cleos' brother Tion Frey for Sansa and Arya, are unacceptable, and Cleos will be expected to carry the small council's counteroffer back to Riverrun. Cleos is not pleased with the prospect of recrossing a war zone and points out that it is Catelyn Stark who wants this peace, not Rob. Tyrion counters that Catelyn wants her daughters and urges Cleos to rest and await further instructions. Tyrion rejoins Jaslyn Bywater watching several hundred recruits drilling beyond the gate. With so many refugees, there is no lack of men joining the city watch for food and a bed, but Tyrion has no illusions about their worth in battle. He commends Bywater for contacting him and instructs him to give Sir Cleos and his escort every hospitality but to keep them outside the city to hide the truth of conditions there. He also instructs Bywater to use the jars the alchemist will deliver to train Spitfire crews to handle wildfire using paint and burning oil. Bywater calls this a wise measure, although he has no love for alchemists pissed. Tyrion agrees but insists he must use what he is given. Back in his litter, Tyrion reflects that if he can use negotiations to keep Rob dreaming of an easy peace at Riverrun until Sir Stafford Lannister readies his new host at Castle Rock, then Stafford and Lord Tywin can smash Rob's forces between them. Tyrion only wishes the Baratheons would be as accommodating. With Renly creeping up the Rose Road with his massive southern army, and Stannis poised to sail his fleet up the black water rush any day, Tyrion takes small comfort from his stockpile of wildfire. A commotion in Cobbler Square pulls Tyrion out of his musings. A sizable crowd listens to the rantings of a prophet garbed as a begging brother, calling the red comet in the sky above Aegon's hill, the father's scourge, he proclaims, We have become swollen, bloated, foul. Brothers, coupled with sisters in the beds of kings, and the fruit of their incest capers in his palace to the piping of a twisted little monkey demon. Highborn ladies fornicate with fools and give birth to monsters. Even the high septon has forgotten the gods. He bathes in scented waters and grows fat on lark and lamprey while his people starve. Pride comes before prayer. Maggots rule our castles, and gold is all but no more. The rotten summer is at an end, and the whoremonger king is brought low. When the boar did open him, a great stench rose to heaven, and a thousand snakes slid forth from his belly, hissing and biting. There comes the harbinger. Cleanse yourself, the gods cry out, lest ye be cleansed. Bathe in the wine of righteousness, or you shall be bathed in fire, fire. Wounded by being called a twisted little monkey demon, Tyrion takes solace from the hoots of derision, drowning the echoing shouts as he orders the burned men to clear a path. He agrees with the prophet about the high septon. However, smiling at the memory of a joke Moonboy made at the gluttonous cleric's expense, returning to the Red Keep without further incident. Tyrion ascends to his chambers in a hopeful mood, thinking all he needs is time to piece it all together. Entering his solar, he is confronted by Cersei, who is furious at him for ignoring her summons and plotting to sell her only daughter like a bag of oats. Knowing his ploy has worked, Tyrion points out princesses like Marcella are born for such marriage alliances, unless Cersei planned to wed her to her brother Tommen. Cersei declares she will not allow Marcella to be shipped off to Dorne. Without missing a beat, Tyrion points out that Dorne will be much safer than King's Landing, and the feud between the Lannisters and House Martell goes back only a generation, whereas the Dornishmen have warred with Storm's End and Highgarden for a millennium. 
Tyrion explains that he proposed nine-year-old Marcella become a ward of Prince Doran Martell until she turns 14, at which time she will marry Tristane Martell, who is just two years older. Cersei insists Marcella will be a hostage, but Tyrion opines that she will be treated more kindly than Sansa Stark, especially with Sir Aris Oakheart of the Kingsguard as her sworn shield. Cersei still worries that Dorne Martell might kill Marcella to avenge the murder of his sister Elia Martell, but Tyrion insists Doran is too honorable to murder an innocent girl and the terms are too rich to refuse. He has also promised the prince his sister's killer, a council seat, and some castles on the Dornish marshes. Cersei accuses Tyrion of offering too much without her consent, but he insists Doran would not accept less and ask if Cersei means to offer sexual favors instead. When she slaps him, Tyrion promises her it will be the last time. But Cersei only laughs and suggests Tyrion's faith that their father's letter will protect him might be as misguided as Eddard Stark's faith in King Robert's last will. Tyrion notes to himself that unlike Lord Eddard, he has the city watch, his clansmen, and a party of sellswords, though he supposed Stark had delusions of support as well. Rather than argue, Tyrion declares that Renly and Stannis will mount Marcella's head beside Cersei's if they take the city. To his astonishment, Cersei begins to cry, something Tyrion has not seen since they were children. Awkwardly, he moves to comfort her, but she wretches away, which hurts more than any slap. He promises nothing will happen to Marcella, but Cersei calls him a liar and declares he has not kept his promise to free Jaime. Tyrion assures her that Jaime remains safe at Riverrun until he can find a way to free him. Cersei laments that if she were a man, she would not have allowed any of this to happen. Cersei wonders how Jaime could let himself be captured and questions what their father is doing hiding in Harrenhal. Tyrion assures her Lord Tywin is making war, proposing that Tywin is a lion waiting to pounce while Rob is a fawn frozen by fear. Cersei is not convinced, pointing out that Jaime would not sit idle if their father were the prisoner. To himself, Tyrion agrees that Jaime never had any patience, but he only says that not everyone can be as bold as Jaime, but there are other ways to win a war, and Harrenhal is strong and well situated. Cersei adds that King's Landing is neither, and Renly's host will soon be at their gates. Tyrion assures her the city wall will not fall in a day, giving Lord Tywin time to march down the King's Road to take Renly in the rear. Hungry for assurance, Cersei asks what will happen if Rob Stark marches. Tyrion explains that Harrenhal prevents Roose Bolton from crossing the Trident to reunite the Northern forces, and even if he could, Rob does not have the strength to take Harrenhal and march on King's Landing. Meanwhile, Lord Tywin's army lives off the fat of the Riverlands, and their uncle Stafford is raising another army at Casterly Rock. Wondering how Tyrion knows all this, Cersei asks if Lord Tywin confided in him. Tyrion replies that he only looked at a map, which causes Cersei to accuse him of mere speculation. Drawing out Rob's peace offer, Tyrion asks why Rob would offer terms, even unacceptable terms, if he were winning. Suddenly, all queen again, Cersei asks how the terms came to Tyrion instead of her, but Tyrion quips that his job as hand is to hand her things. As he hands her the letter, Tyrion muses that getting slapped by Cersei is a small price to pay for our agreement to the Dornish marriage, which he can sense he will get now. The identity of an informer is just the plum in his pudding. Bran rides his horse dancer into the Great Hall of Winterfell for the harvest feast. He wishes Summer was with him, but Sir Roderick Cassell was unyielding. From the crowded benches, men shout, Stark! and Winterfell as he passes. Bran knows they are cheering for the harvest, for victory, and for all the Starks who came before rather than for him, but he still swells with pride and even forgets he is broken until he reaches the dais. There Osha and Horda unstrap him and carry him to the high seat. Sir Roderick, his daughter Beth, and Maester Lewin are seated to Bran's left and Rickon to his right. His hair uncut since their mother left because he bit the last girl to try. After Sir Roderick bellows for quiet, Bran welcomes the guests and asks them to thank the gods for Rob's victories and for the bountiful harvest. His toast of, may there be a hundred more, brings an echoing cheer and Sir Roderick says his father would be proud. 
They feast on course after course, including seafood brought by Lord Wyman Manderley from White Harbor. Manderley has also brought musicians, but only Hoarder seems to be listening, and the songs are drowned beneath the talk and laughter. Sir Roderick and Maester Lewin talk over Beth's head, while Rickon screams happily with Little Walder and Big Walder. Bran did not want the Walders at the high table, but Maester Lewin reminded him they would become kin when Rob weds one of their aunts and Arya marries their uncle Elmar Frey, though Bran argued Arya would never stand for that. Each dish is served to Bran first, and soon he is full and must nod approval rather than taste everything. As instructed, he sends particularly delicious dishes to the lords as a gesture of friendship, salmon to sad lady Donella Hornwood, boars to Moore and Hothar Umber, goose and berries to Clay Serwin, lobster to Joseph, the master of horse for training dancer, sweets to Hodar and Old Nan because he loves them, and beets and turnips to the Walders because Sir Roderick insists he gives them something. Bran watches the feast detachedly, seeing everything yet a part of nothing. He sees Osha break a flagon over the head of a tall heart man for sliding his hand under her skirt, though another woman does not seem to mind Micken's hand down her bodice. He watches Farlin make his red bitch beg, and old Nan pluck at the crust of a hot pie. On the dais, he sees Lord Manderley attacking a plate of lampreys in his special wide chair, sad lady Hornwood picking listlessly at her food and the umber brothers playing a drinking game the heat and noise soon grow too much and bran finds himself dreaming of the cool in the godswood studying his father's ornate goblet bran recalls the welcoming feast for king robert and realizes everyone else is gone either to war captivity the wall or their graves even the men at the tables are new, since everyone who went south with his father is dead, and the rest rode to war with Rob. When he wonders who will be missing next year, and the year after, Bran feels like crying but reminds himself he is a Stark in Winterfell and almost a man grown. The doors to the hall open and Albelly leads in two new guests, Mira and Jojen Reed of Greywater Watch. Bran recognizes them as Cranig men from the Neck, a shy and simple folk who rarely leave their swamps, but he hears little Walder calling them mudmen and explaining to Rickon that they are thieves and cravens with green teeth from eating frogs. As places are hurriedly prepared on the dais, Sir Roderick explains that these must be the children of Howland Reed, a great friend and staunch companion of Bran's father during Robert's rebellion. The slender girl Mira is armed with woven net, bronze knife, and a frog spear as well as an iron helm leather shield, and bronze scale jerkin. Her younger brother Jojen is unarmed and dressed all in green, which brings out the deep green of his eyes. Kneeling before the dais, the reeds explains that they have come to renew House Reed's fealty to the king in the north. Bran explains that Rob is away fighting, but says that they may say their words to him. Together, the reeds recite their ancient oaths, swearing by earth and water, by bronze and iron, and by ice and fire, never to fail the Starks of Winterfell. Unsure how to proceed, Bran finally decides on May your winters be short and your summers bountiful, and bids them rise. Mira offers gifts of fish, frog, and fowl, and Bran offers them the meat and mead of Winterfell in return. Jojen immediately asks where the direwolves are, and Rickon answers that they are in the godswood because Shaggy Dog was bad. When Mira says that Jojen would like to see them, Little Walder warns that they will bite. Pleased by the reed's interest, Bran promises that Summer at least will not bite and will keep Shaggy Dog away. He cannot recall ever meeting a Cranigman and would like to talk more, but the feast is too noisy. When he learns from Sir Roderick that they truly eat frogs, Bran sends the reeds mutton, aurochs, and beasts too, which they seem to like. When Mira catches him staring, Bran blushes. After the tables are cleared away, the music and singing grows wilder. Morris Umber grabs a passing serving girl and begins whirling her about the floor and others soon join in. Hodar dances by himself while Wyman Manderley and then Clay Serwin partner with little Beth Cassell. Sir Roderick approaches Lady Hornwood but she excuses herself. Once again, unable to participate, Bran watches long enough to be polite then calls Hodor to carry him to bed, conscious of the stares of onlookers. Just outside the hall, they come upon Joseph and a giggling woman with her skirts above her waist. The girl screams when she sees Hodor watching, so Bran has to tell him to leave them be. 
After getting help with his boots and breeches, Bran dismisses Hodor and lies down to sleep. Then he recalls his father telling him the Kingsguard were once a shining example and the finest knight he ever saw was Sir Arthur Dane, who would have killed him but for Howland Reed. His father became sad at that and spoke no further, but now Bran wishes he had asked him what he meant. Bran goes to sleep thinking of knights, but his dreams are of wolves in the godswood again, and he can hear and smell the feast still going on. At the rattle of iron, he and his brother race to confront the strange intruders, a female and a young male with no taint of fear. Bran recognizes Mira's voice when she asks if Jojen knew that wolves would be so big. Georgian points out they are still growing and opines that Shaggy Dog is full of fear and rage, but Summer is stronger than he knows. Mira questions her brother, but Jojen insists that this is not the day he dies and reaches out to touch Summer. At his touch, Bran loses contact and suddenly feels he is falling again. A cruel dawn wakes Catelyn from sweet dreams of happy family life. She is weary of riding, hurting, and being strong, but she knows she cannot allow herself to be weak today. Outside her tent, she finds Shad stirring oats into a kettle. Sir Wendell Manderley suggests supplementing this with roast quail, but Catelyn decides oats and bread are sufficient since they have many leagues to travel. Her party includes 20 of Rob's best Winterfell men and five lordlings, including Sir Wendell, Sir Perwin Frey, Lucas Blackwood, and Robin Flint to add weight and honor to her negotiations with King Renly. It is a mission Catelyn never wanted, but Rob insisted he had no one else. Lord Hoster Tully was too ill, and he needed Brendan Tully to command his scouts and Sir Edmure Tully to hold Riverrun when he marched. Catelyn argued that marching was rash, but Rob insisted waiting would make him look afraid and weaken his position, especially since Lysa Arryn will not support him. Catelyn feared he planned to play into Tywin Lannister's hand and march on Harrenhal, but Rob countered that he said nothing of Harrenhal. Catelyn smiles at the memory of Rob's obvious ploy of threatening to send Great John Umber in her place, given how ill-suited the Great John is to treat with a man like Renly. Before leaving, she wrote to Bran and Rickon and visited her father, but he mistook her for her mother. Half a day's ride from Renly's camp, they are spotted from a windmill and intercepted by Sir Colin of Greenspool with 20 men. When Catelyn announces herself as the envoy of the King in the North, Sir Colin insists that Renly is King of all the Seven Kingdoms and escorts her to his camp at Bitterbridge, where the Rose Road crosses the Mander. With nearly all the chivalry of the South behind him, Renly's camp is immense. Thousands of cook fires cloud the air and a vast menagerie of banners fly from a veritable forest of staffs. Monstrous siege engines line the road, tents and pavilions dot the landscape, and the whole place bustles with people. Everywhere Catelyn sees the golden rose of House Tyrell, and across the river Renly and his storm lords have raised their own standards. Catelyn recognizes many of the sigils, but for each one she knows there are dozens she does not, all assembled to make Renly a king. Passing through a line of pavilions, they come upon a tourney melee taking place beneath the battlements of a small castle. Less than a score of contestants remain a horse, cheered on by hundreds of spectators. Since penetrating the crowd proves difficult, Sir Colin asks that Catelyn's escort wait until he presents her to the king. A roar goes up when a knight of House Tarth in cobalt armor unhorses Red Ronnet Connington, but the carnage makes Catelyn think it mad for Renly to be playing at war with real enemies all around. Among the lords and ladies in the gallery, Catelyn recognizes stout Lord Mathis Rowan, delicate Lady Arwen Oakheart, and martial Lord Randall Tarley, but others she knows only by sigil or not at all. The handsome King Renly sits in their midst, looking like a youthful ghost of his brother Robert and laughing with his young queen Marjorie Tyrell, a girl of Rob's age with a shy smile and curly brown hair. Catelyn knows their marriage is the mortar of the great Southern Alliance and the rose sigil and green and gold colors of House Tyrell are prominent in Renly's slender crown and velvet tunic. Out on the field, only four men remain and both King and Commons obviously favor young Sir Loras Tyrell in his silver mail and rainbow cloak. Two others ally against the blue-clad knight from Tarth, but are quickly unhorsed. 
Forced to discard his now broken shield for the final duel, the Blue Knight is at in a disadvantage and soon disarmed by Sir Loras. Yet, as Loras prepares the final blow, the Blue Knight charges into it, grapples him to the ground, and opens Tyrell's visor with a dirk to make him yield. As the Blue Knight salutes the king in victory, squires rush to help Loras Tyrell remove his helm, and Catelyn is startled by his youth and beauty. Renly then bids the champion to approach, and there are a few cries of Tarth and oddly, a beauty, but most remain silent. Renly declares the Blue Knight to be all his father claims since Loras is rarely unhorsed, but Catelyn overhears accusations of trickery from the crowd. When she asks why the man in blue is so disliked, Sir Colin explains that the champion is no man but Brienne of Tarth, the daughter of Lord Selwyn the Evenstar, who is often called Brienne the Beauty, though never to her face. King Renly officially declares Brienne the champion as the last mounted of 116 knights and offers her any reward within his power. Brienne asks to be made one of his seven rainbow guard, and Renly agrees. It is only when Brienne removes her great helm that Catelyn understands Sir Colin's words. The only thing beautiful about Brienne are her girlish blue eyes. Her face is broad, coarse, and freckled with a large mouth full of crooked teeth and a nose that has been broken more than once. Catelyn is filled with pity for the girl, yet Brienne looks anything but unfortunate when Renly fastens the rainbow cloak to her shoulders and her face lights up with a smile as she proudly pledges to give her life for him. Sir Colin interjects to introduce Catelyn, though she needs to insist that Rob is king in the north as well as lord of Winterfell. Renly looks surprised but greets her warmly and introduces his queen, who offers condolences for her husband's death. Renly even swears to bring her Cersei Lannister's head when he takes King's Landing, but Catelyn replies that justice will be enough. Brienne of Tarth notes that Catelyn should kneel and refer to the king as your grace, but Catelyn insists they have more pressing matters to discuss. Some of Renly's lord bristle, but the king only laughs and asks when Rob plans to march on Harrenhal. Unsure whether Renly will be a friend or foe, Catelyn only replies that she does not sit on the war council. Renly asks about Jaime Lannister, and learning he is a prisoner, declares that the dire wolf is gentler than the lion. Lord Randall Tarly pipes up that Rob should have come to pay homage in person, but Catelyn counters that her son is fighting a war, not playing at one. Renly grins and warns Lord Tarly that he is outmatched, then offers Catelyn the use of his own pavilion since he is guesting at Lord Laurent Caswell's castle and invites her to the evening's farewell feast. Renly's pavilion is so massive and richly furnished that Catelyn understands why his host moves so slowly and that evening she is seated between Mathis Rowan and Sir John Fossaway. Meanwhile, Brienne of Tarth is seated at the far end of the high table in knight's garments instead of a lady's and Catelyn notes that out of her armor Brienne looks muscular, plain, and ungainly and judges from the woman's actions she knows it. Singers and tumblers entertain them and the food is rich and plentiful but Catelyn eats only sparingly and watches those around her. King Renly speaks amiably to all and sometimes feeds Queen Marjorie choice morsels or kisses her lightly, but it is Sir Loris who shares most of his jests and confidences. Others are less moderate. The brothers Joshua and Elias Willem dispute who will be the first over the walls of King's Landing. Lord Varner dandles a serving girl. Sir Guyard Morrigan sings a bad song about nodding lion's tails. Sir Mark Malindor feeds his pet monkey from his plate and Sir Tanton Fossaway climbs onto the table and swears to slay Sandor Clegane in single combat. When a gold-dressed fool and a dwarf elicit gales of laughter by mocking Jamie and Tyrion Lannister, Lord Rowan remarks to Catelyn that Renly and his favorites are all very young. Seeing Lord Bryce Caron goad Sir Robar Royce into juggling daggers, Catelyn recalls that none of them are old enough to have seen war, so they think it is a game and believe themselves immortal. She tells Lord Rowan that war will make them old, as it did her generation, and says she pities them because they are knights of summer and winter is coming. Brienne chimes in to disagree, saying, Winter will never come for the likes of us. Should we die in battle, they surely will sing of us. It's always summer in the songs. In the songs, all knights are gallant, all maids are beautiful, and the sun is always shining. Catelyn knows that winter comes for everyone, as it did for her when Ned died. But King Renly saves her from having to say so by asking her to take the air with him. Brienne wants to come along as well, 
but Renly insists another sword will make no difference in the midst of his own army. Brienne seems very hurt by the refusal. As they walk, Renly asks if Sir Barristan Selmy has joined Rob at Riverrun. When Catelyn seems puzzled, Renly tells her of Selmy's dismissal and his vow to serve the true king, adding that Brienne's position in the Rainbow Guard was meant for Selmy. Next, Renly explains that he offered Ned a hundred swords to seize Joffrey, but fled when refused because he lacked the strength to act alone and feared Cersei might kill him after Robert died. He adds that he liked Ned well enough and knew him to be Robert's loyal friend, but says Ned would not listen or bend. Leading her out onto the roof, Renly shows Catelyn his army's countless campfires and asks how many fires burn around Riverrun. He guesses that Rob has 40,000 men at most, though Catelyn knows the real number is much lower. Renly declares that he has twice as many with him and another 10,000 with Mace Tyrell at High Garden, a strong garrison at Storm's End, and soon all the power of Dorne and his brother Stannis Baratheon at Dragonstone. Catelyn counters sharply that Renly seems to have forgotten that Stannis has the better claim. Renly replies that Stannis is respected and feared but not loved and would make an appalling king. Gesturing to his army, Renly declares that his claim is as good as Robert's ever was. Then he offers term. Rob can rule in Winterfell and even go on calling himself King in the North, but he must bend the knee to Renly as his overlord. When Catelyn asks the consequence of refusal, Renly insists he means to be king of a unified realm and reminds her that Torrin Stark was wise to yield to Aegon I Targaryen, adding that if they join together the war is good as done. Just then, a messenger rides into the yard with news that Storm's End is under attack, although Sir Courtney Penrose defies the besiegers. When Renly protests that he would know if Lord Tywin had left Harrenhal, the messenger replies that these are no Lannisters. It is Lord Stannis at the gates calling himself King Stannis. Jon Snow is riding beside a grumpy Lord Commander with an equally soaked and grumpy raven on his shoulder. There have been six days of rain and the ground is treacherous. Jon thinks about Pippar and Totter sitting near the fire in the common room. The Lord Commander is relieved when he hears Jarman Buckwell's horn. It means there are still people at Craster's Keep. They have so far passed through seven villages without seeing anybody. Jon has heard many tales about Craster. Thorin Smallwood swears he is a friend of the Watch, though he has an unsavory reputation. Dywin says he is a clean slayer, liar, raper, craven, and slaver. The Lord Commander tells John to spread the word down the column that he wants no trouble with Craster's women, and the men will mind their hands and avoid taking to the women. As he rides down the line, he finally comes to Sam with the baggage. The ravens are very unruly, and Sam explains that they hate the rain like men. Sam states he is doing all right but wet, and when he is told that Craster's keep is just ahead, he tells John that Edison Tollett says Craster marries his daughters, only follows his own laws, and that Dywin told Bran he has black blood. Also, that his mother is a wadling that laid with a ranger. Sam almost goes on to call Craster a bastard, but John finishes for him and says he has heard the word before. John finally makes it to the rear to give word to Sir Auden Withers, who considers it welcome news. He always looked tired, but the rain has made him look much worse. On the way back up the column, John cuts through the woods. When he hears rustling, he thinks it is ghosts, but it is Dywin and Gren. John gives them the news that Craster is alive, and discussion turns to how many wives he has. Then Ghost is loping beside John's horse. John rides ahead to the keep. When he gets to the keep, he is very disappointed. He did not expect a stone castle, but what he finds, he would call a meeting heap. Inside the compound, he sees a little naked girl pulling carrots, and two women tie a pig for slaughter. He can hear Chet's hounds barking, being answered by the bark of Craster's dogs. Some of the dogs break off when they see Ghost, while others growl and Ghost ignores them. John estimates that only 30 or maybe 50 will get to sleep in the hall, but not their 200. Dolores Ed has been entrusted with the commander's mount and tells John that he is to join the commander in the hall, but the wolf should stay outside. Inside the squalid, foul-smelling hall, there are already two dozen rangers, including Jarman Buckwell and Thorin Smallwood. John thinks how he looked forward to seeing the wonders beyond the wall. It is a pity Pippar and Tartar are missing this. 
Craster is the only one sitting in a chair. Even the commander has to sit on a bench, and seeing him, John thinks of old Nan's tales of wildling drinking blood from human skulls. He overhears Craster say he has not seen Brandon Stark for three years. In the background, shabbily dressed women prepare the food and pass out beer while a dozen puppies and a pig skulk around. Marmont tells Craster that Ben was searching for the vanished Sir Waymar Royce, Garrod, and Will. Craster recalls the three men but does not know where they went. He does complain that his wives made cow eyes at young Sir Waymar, who was too proud to sleep under his roof. The commander tells him about the villages they found abandoned and the whites that attacked him at Castle Black. Craster feigns ignorance, but one of his wives recognizes the truth in the tale by the look of horror on her face. Craster also refuses to offer an escort back to the wall, saying he is of the free folk. He even has his wife confirm that this is their place. Craster keeps them safe, and it is better to die free. Jarman Buckwell asks about Craster's king, Mance Raider, and Craster states that free folk have no need of kings, and that when one of Mance's men arrived to tell him he had to leave his keep and grovel at Mance's feet, he sent the man back without his tongue. Craster then tells the commander that they can sleep on the floor, but he will only feed 20. Mormont responds that the roof would be welcome, and they have food and wine which they will share. Craster expresses particular interest in the wine, and then adds that any man that lays a hand on one of his wives loses his hand. Mormont agrees, but does not look pleased. Craster now asks if Mormont has a man that can draw maps, and John steps forward stating that Sam likes maps. Mormont tells John to get Sam with quill and parchment and bring Mormont's axe as a guest gift. Craster notes that John has the look of a Stark, and he is told that he is Mormont's steward and squire. When Craster hears the name Snow, he understands that John is a bastard and declares that a man who wants to bed a woman should marry her like he does and then tells John to do his service. John almost collides into Arton Withers as he is leaving. Outside, he finds tent have gone up all over the compound. He finds Dolores Ed and tells him of the request. Ed states that the commander will get his axe back buried in his skull. When he hears that the commander wants wine as well, he says that Craster's drunk will only cut off an ear when he attempts to slay them. When John tells Dolores Ed that Smallwood says Craster is their friend, he responds the difference between wildling friends and enemies is that friends bury them in secret graves. John hears a shout of fear as he finishes up feeding the horses. He finds Ghost with two rabbits confronting a 15-year-old girl. John promises that Ghost will not hurt her. He asks her if she is one of Craster's daughters and is told she is now his wife. She was hoping to breed the rabbits. John can tell that Ghost has gone after the caged rabbits. He must have been hungry. He would pay for them but has no money. So he tells her that the Night's Watch will make good. She calls him Lord and he responds he is no Lord. Then Ranger Lark, the sister man, tells her that he is Lord Snow himself and then notes that the wolf is looking hungry. John tells Lark that he is scaring her, only to have Chet respond that Lark is warning her. The girl then remembers she is not to talk to them. Chet tells John that he would not be so bold without Ghost around. Chet lost his position as Maester Eamon Stewart because of John. When Lark joins in about John being a coward without his wolf, he leaves. It takes a while for John to find Sam, and it is actually Ghost that finds him under a rock outcrop. Ghost has given John the second rabbit, and John shows Sam and then informs him that the commander wants him to create a map. John proceeds to cook the scrawny rabbit over a fire. It smells wonderful, and the other rangers give them envious looks. As they eat, Sam asks if Craster is a savage, as they say. After Sam leaves with the quill and parchment, John falls asleep thinking that maybe the commander will learn something that will lead them to Uncle Benjamin. He wakes to dawn and Ghost is gone. Everything is coated in a fine ice glaze and John thinks of his sisters and that Sansa would call this enchantment. He hears his name called and finds the girl with the rabbits wearing Sam's cloak. She asks him if he is the king's brother and he tells her that he is his half-brother. John is concerned about Craster, but Gilly tells him her father drank too much and will sleep most of the day. She then asks him about King's justice. She wants to leave. Craster should not even notice since he has 19 wives. She explains that she is pregnant and while it will not be too bad if she has a girl, since Craster will let her grow up and marry her, if it is a boy, he will give it to the gods.
Nella has told her that the baby will be male and Gilly believes she knows these things having had six boys. She continues by telling John that when the white cold comes, he sacrifices the boys and it has been coming more often so he has had to give the sheep, which are now gone. Next it will be the dogs. The cold gods come at night and are white shadows. John thinks about the two whites, asks the color of their eyes, and is told they are bright blue. She tells him that she knows he did not take of Craster's hospitality, so John is not bound to Craster and asks to be taken to the wall, but John tells her they are going the other direction and that it is for the old crow to decide, not him. Disappointed, she leaves. He joins Dywin Grin and Hake for breakfast. Dywin claims that he had three of the women that night, but he is not believed. John asks if Sam slept in the hall and is told that it was impossible to sleep with the hard ground, the ill-smelling rushes, and the snoring, particularly the snoring of Brown Benar. John excuses himself to find the Lord Commander. On his way, he passes by the scouts, and Jarman Buckwell tells him to keep a good edge on his sword since they will be needing it soon enough. When he enters the hall, the Commander's Raven announces his presence with a request for corn. When the commander asks, John tells him the rain has stopped, but it is cold. Marmont tells him to saddle his horse, for he plans to leave within the hour. He tells John that there is some food, but John declines, deciding he will not take of Craster's hospitality. He finds Sam behind the hall with Gilly. She quietly leaves, and Sam tells John he was hoping he could do something for Gilly. John asks what he could have done, wrap her in a cloak and take her with them. Sam admits John is right, but she is afraid and maybe when they come back they can take her. John states the commander will not let them take one of Craster's wives, then quickly excuses himself because he has to groom and saddle the horses. As he rides alongside Mormont, John notes that Craster has no sons or sheep. Mormont admits that Craster gives his sons to the wood and tells John that all the rangers know but will not talk of it. If he could have, Mormont states he would have taken the boys. They could raise them to the black, but the wildlings serve cooler gods. Mormont then asks if John spoke to one of Craster's wives, and John admits he did. Then Mormont tells John that if he had his way with Craster sprawled out drunk and the new axe below, one of his wives could easily kill him. However, the Night's Watch need Craster, and his keep has been responsible for saving many rangers' lives. Mormont can tell John wants to say something and tells him to. John states that his father said that a brutal or unjust bannerman shames his liege lord. Mormont responds that Craster is his own man and has sworn no vows. After John informs Mormont that Buckwell has told him he would soon need his sword, Mormont explains that Craster told them Mance Raider is gathering his people at Frostfangs, a cruel, inhospitable wilderness of stone and ice. Mormont expects Mance to invade the realm. John mentions that Raymond Redbeard in the time of his grandfather's grandfather and before that Bale the Bard invaded the realm. Morma admits this, adding some more names including Joraman who blew the horn of winter to wake the giants, but not only is the watch a shadow of itself, Winterfell is weak with Robb Stark's marching south. This is a great opportunity for the wildlings. Their only choice is to find Mance Raider and stop him. Theon is admiring the new longship his father gave him. It is not as large as the Great Kraken or Iron Victory, but looks fast, has 50 oars, and will handle 100 men. He is interrupted by a striking ironborn woman calling herself Esgred, daughter of Ambrode, wife to Sigrin, the shipwright. Theon is taken by her and tells her that he has had women enough but none like her, adding that his cock has gone hard for her. She feels it and tells him he is no liar. When he tells her it hurts fiercely, she states poor lordling and claims to be newly with child. He tells her that this is all the better because he cannot get her pregnant. When this does not sway her, he asks if she has ever had a prince and how she can tell her children when she is wrinkled and gray she had a king. He next asks if he should name his ship after her keep her in a tower with only jewels to wear like a princess of song. She tells him that she built his ship so he should name it after her. He tells her that Sigrin is wasted on her and she tells him that Sigrin said the ship was wasted on him. Theon bristles and learns she knows who he is. She then asks him what he thinks of the ship since Sigrin will want to know. 
Theon says he likes it and asks if it is as fast as it looks. She tells him that she is faster if the master knows how to handle her. Theon admits it's been a few years since he sailed a ship and acknowledges to himself that he never captained one, but he is a Greyjoy so the sea is in his blood. When Theon states he would never mistreat such a fair maiden, Esgrid states she is a sea bitch. Theon then states that he will call his ship Sea Bitch. When she reproachfully states he was going to name the ship after her, he tells her he did. Then he asks her to come on board so they can bless the ship with the milk of their loins. She tells him that the drowned god may not take kindly to this sacrilege. The next day, Theon's uncle Aaron is to bless the ship to the drowned god with sea water. Theon replies, Bugger the drowned god. If he troubles us, I'll drown him again. We're off to war within a fortnight. Would you send me into battle all sleepless with longing? When she still refuses, Theon states his ship is well named. She touches his crotch and asks if he will steer with this. He asks if she would come back to Pike with him to the feast. He does not tell her that Lord Balon Greyjoy is having a feast every night while waiting for his captains to arrive. She teases him some more, even unlacing his breeches. She tells him she does not have a horse and finally agrees to ride with him on his horse back to Pike, refusing to ride Theon Squire's horse since the squire would have to walk. As they walk back to the inn in Lordsport to get Theon's horse, Theon notices that the people grew very quiet as they pass and acknowledge them with bows. It is about time. Many of those in the town were the men of Lord Garold, good brother of Great Wick, who had arrived with forty ships. As they pass, Theon thinks how busy Otter Gimpsney's whorehouse will be and that his companion was more to his taste. The woman asks Theon about his crew. As they pass, she calls to Bluetooth, and Theon learns that he has his own ship. Theon thinks how long it has been, and any friends he had were now strangers. He tells her that his uncle Victorian Greyjoy has loaned his steersman, Ryman Stormdrunk. She calls also to Uller, Call, and Skite, and they learn that Skite's brother, Eldis, is dead. They pass the ship Miriam, which could not leave because Lord Balon was not allowing any ships to leave. As they do, the girl on board calls to Theon, and he has to admit to Ezra that he slept with her even though she was soft and bland, but there was no other woman on board. At the end, his squire Wex Pike ignores Theon's call, and so Theon had to grab him by the ear from a dicing table. Theon liked having Wex as a squire because he was born dumb. When Wex sees Esgrid, his eyes go wide. Theon sends him to saddle the horses. Theon's horse, Smiler, being an impressive beast that he had purchased from Lord Sewyn Botley, the Iron Islanders tend to be indifferent riders, and the horse had proven too much for Lord Botley, and he was happy to sell, Wex being part of the deal. Theon was happy to be able to find a good war horse, not wanting to go to war without one. Esgret is impressed. Theon mounts and pulls Esgret in front of him. As they ride, he puts his hand on her breast, but she removes them each time, finally ensuring he cannot put it again on her breast. When she asks if his father will welcome her, he tells her that he hardly welcome his heir. She tells him that there are his uncles and his sister. He tells her that his sister wears a male hauberk with boiled leather and small clothes, has a nose like a vulture, pimples, and no breast. He will marry her off if someone will take her. She then asks about his uncles. Theon knows that his uncle are a threat to his inheritance since an uncle deposing of a weak nephew had happened in the Iron Islands. Theon does not believe he is weak and will be stronger by the time his father dies. He tells her that Aaron only cares for his gods and Victorian is strong and tireless and dutiful. She mentions that Euron Greyjoy has no lack of cunning and Theon replies that he has not been seen for two years and may be dead. He and his ship's silence with its black sails and dark red hull were infamous. Esgrid admits that he may be dead, and if he is alive he would be half a stranger, and the Ironborn would not seat a stranger on the sea stone chair. The idea that the Ironborn would not make a stranger king bothers Theon since he is more of a stranger than Euron, but he does have time to prove himself. Theon mentions that he will be seated on the dais with his father, but will ensure that Helia will provide an honor spot for her. He will come down to join her when his father leaves. He has no belly for drink.
She states that it is grievous when a man grows old, and Theon replies that Balon is but the father of a great man. She then asks what she will wear, and Theon tells her that one of his mother's own gown might fit. She is in Harlaw. Esgred then asks if he will visit his mother since she is only a day's sail away, and Theon replies that his father relies on him, and maybe when peace comes. Theon again tries to seduce her, and she resists and asks about Winterfell. He obliges, surprised with some of what he told her. When they reach the castle, hounds assail them as Theon helps Esgred off. When the stable boy arrives, Theon tells him to get the horse and to get the damn dogs away. Instead, the stable boy, smiling, calls the woman Asha, stating she is back. She tells the stable boy how she arrived with Lord Goodbrother and stayed at the inn the previous night. Theon gapes at her as she tells him the pimple disappeared when the breast came, but she still has the vulture's beak. She tells him that she did not tell him who she was because she wanted to see who he was first. She excuses herself saying she wonders if she still has the chainmail gown to wear over her boiled leather small clothes. Wex is smirking at him so he hits the boy twice. Back in his cold chambers, despite the braziers, he thinks how Asha made a fool of him and enjoyed it and even undid his breeches. He now has no place here because of her. When he finally hears the distant music, he knows it is time to go. He chooses plain clothes with no jewelry. He has no jewelry bought with iron, which irritates him. His curse luck that he only killed the poor. He enters the hall to find it filled with near 400 lords and captains. All the houses present except for House Stonehouse and House Drum. This includes House Harlaw, House Blacktide, House Spar, House Merlin, and House Goodbrother, House Saltcliffe, House Sunderley, House Botley, and House Winch. Along with the drinking, there were the dancers doing the finger dance, where spinning axes often took fingers. Theon arrives at the dais to find his uncles to his father's right and Asha to his left. His father tells him he is late. When he sits at the seat next to Asha, he hisses to her that she is in his seat and she replies that his place is in Winterfell and asks where his pretty clothes are. She replies that her hallbook must have rusted away. When a thrall arrives to serve wine or beer, she asks if he still has a taste for her mother's milk. When Theon asks if every word she told him was a lie, she says not. She calls to one of the dancers, Rolf, who throws an axe to her. When she catches his handily and splits Theon's trencher with it, it splashes his mantle, telling him the axe is her husband. Then she pulls a dirk from between her breasts and tells him this is her suckling babe. The hall is suddenly ringing with laughter and Theon realizes it is at him. He then tells him that if he had trouble to learn anything about Sigrin, she could not have fooled him. Why should men fight and die for him when he knows nothing and no one in the islands? He replies that he is their prince. She tells him that it might be true by the laws of the Greenlands, but the Ironborn make their own laws. Finally, Lord Balon rises and tells those on the dais to join him in his solar when they are finished. He leaves and then his brothers follow. Theon is rising to leave and Asha asks him why he is in such a rush since his father has been waiting for him for years, but if he fears, scurry after him. Theon sits back annoyed, saying he runs after no man. She tells him no man but every woman. He replies that it was not me who grabbed your cock and replies she does not have one. He tells her that he is a man with natural hungers and asks what sort of unnatural creature is she. She tells him she is only a shy maid and gives his cock a squeeze under the table. With that, Theon stumbles to find his father. Theon arrives in the damp, drafty solar to find his father before the brazier buried under sealskin robes, his uncles on either side. On seeing him arrive, his father tells him it is time he heard his plans and really shuts him up when he states he had suggestions. He first tells Theon that he will command eight ships that will harry the stony shore and will be accompanied by Aaron and Dagmar. Theon feels slapped, being sent to do Reaver's work, burning the houses of fishermen, and his father did not even trust him sufficiently, sending Aaron and Dagmar with him. Balon tells Asha, who has just slipped in, that she will take thirty ships with picked men to take the castle at Deepwood Mott. Asha states that she always wanted a castle, while Theon thinks it should have been him given this tax since he had been there several times. Victarion gets the main thrust at Mount Caelin, sailing up the Salt Spear and the Fever River. Once they hold Mount Caelin, Robb Stark, the pup, will not be able to go back north. 
Theon tries to tell Balon that the lords hold the castles, but again Balon shuts him up, saying, The lords have gone south with the pup. Winterfell may hold out for a year, but the rest shall be theirs. On the rope bridge, a sudden gust of wind causes him to stumble to his knees. Asha is there to help him up and guide him across the rest of the bridge, telling him he cannot hold his wine either. Theon tells her he liked her better as Esgrid, and she tells him she liked him better when he was nine. Tyrion passes Sir Meryn Trent as he enters Cersei's chambers, where he finds the recently knighted Sir Lancel Lannister singing to his sister. He compliments both, which unnerves Lancel. Tyrion asks Cersei to dismiss Lancel, as there is an important matter for them to discuss. She immediately thinks it is about the begging brothers that were incarcerated after claiming the gods are punishing everyone for Jaime killing the rightful king. Cersei complains that Jaslyn Bywater did nothing, so she commanded Vilar to attend to the matter. Tyrion is irritated that Vilar dragged half a dozen scabbers prophets to the dungeons without consulting him, but will not fight over it. After he asks if the bed she sits on is the one where Robert died, which she confirms, saying it gives her sweet dreams, he tells her that Stannis Baratheon has sailed from Dragonstone, and not to King's Landing, but to Storm's End to lay siege, and Renly Baratheon is riding to meet him. Tyrion, however, thinks it will end in battle rather than an agreement, since the brothers are too different yet alike. They laugh heartily, and Cersei is so happy she even hugs him. He fills two cups with wine, adding some powders to hers. As they toast, Tyrion wonders if this is the Cersei Jaime sees, and is almost sorry for poisoning her. The next morning, Cersei is ill, so Tyrion holds audience alone. In the hall, there are both Lannister guardsmen and gold cloaks standing across from each other, with Bronn and Sir Preston Greenfield flanking the throne. In attendance are lovely Sansa Stark, the coughing Lord Giles Rosby, his cousin Tyrek Lannister, who recently married young Emerson Hayford, he is teased with the nickname Wet Nurse. Sir Cleos Frey approaches and Grand Maester Pycelle announces they cannot accept Rob's terms. Tyrion then gives Sir Cleos their own terms. Rob Stark must lay down his sword, swear fealty, and return to Winterfell. He must free my brother unharmed and place his host under Jaime's command to march against the rebels Renly and Stannis Baratheon. Each of Stark's bannermen must send us a son as hostage. A daughter will suffice where there is no son. They shall be treated gently and given high places here at court, so long as their fathers commit no new treasons. When Sir Cleos states that Rob will not agree to these terms, Tyrion continues with, Tell him that we have raised another great host at Castle Rock, that soon it will march on him from the west while my lord father advances from the east. Tell him that he stands alone, without hope of allies. Stannis and Renly Baratheon war against each other, and the Prince of Dorne has consented to wed his son Tristane to Princess Marcella. As to this of my cousins, we offer Harry and Karstark and Sir Willis Manderley for Willem Lannister and Lord Sirwin and Sir Donald Locke for your brother Theon. Tell Stark that two Lannisters are worth four Northmen in any season. His father's bones he shall have as a gesture of Joffrey's good faith. This raises murmurs of delight and laughter from his, the audience. Sir Cleos asks about the sword ice and Rob's sisters. Tyrion says that he will have the sword when he makes peace and the sisters when Jaime is released. Tyrion then tells Vilar that Sir Cleos is to have a Lannister escort since he is a cousin and that Vilar is to take all of his guardsmen. This raises concern from Pycelle. Valar stands stone still. Tyrion states that the gold cloaks and king's guard are adequate to protect the king and queen. Vara smiles knowingly. Littlefinger feigns boredom, and Pycelle is looking confused. Tyrion attempts to close the meeting, but Sir Alistair Thorne speaks up, complaining about being ignored. Tyrion feigns ignorance of him being in the city, blaming Bronn for making his friend that walked the wall with weight. Sir Alistair Thorne wants to speak to the king, but is told he is playing with his new crossbow, which Tyrion has just given him, so Sir Alistair will have to talk with the king's servants. Sir Alistair relates how they found the corpses of two long dead rangers and brought them back to the wall. They rose that night and killed Sir Jeremy Riker and attempted to murder Sir Jor Mormont. Tyrion gets assurances that the Lord Commander survived, and they killed these two dead men. Sir Alistair tells them that they were dead the first time, pale and cold with black hands and feet. 
as proof he had a hand, but it rotted away while he waited. Tyrion thinks of the dread he felt when he was on the wall with Jon Snow. He orders Littlefinger to send Sir Alistair back with a hundred spades to bury the dead and prevent them from walking, and also tells Sir Jaslyn that Sir Alistair will have the pick of the dungeons to use the spades. Tyrion is informed that the dungeons are near empty, since Yorin had already taken all the likely men. He tells Sir Jaslyn to arrest some more, or to spread the word that there is food at the wall. Sir Alistair is not easily dismissed, trying to warn Tyrion of the danger. Sir Preston intervenes, and Sir Alistair knows better than to challenge a king's guard. Then Bronn marches Sir Alistair from the hall. Varys compliments Tyrion on how he handled the situation. Littlefinger asks if he meant to send all his guards away, to which Tyrion responds, only his sister's guards. Tyrion notes that Littlefinger is not happy with him, and Littlefinger replies that he loves him as much as ever, but that Marcella Baratheon cannot wed Robert Aaron if she weds Tristan Martell, and to leave him out of the next deception. Glancing at the knife at Littlefinger's hip, Tyrion apologizes, stating the realm needs him. Tyrion asks Varys to walk with him. Varys tells him that Cersei will never let him send away her guard, and Tyrion replies that Varys is going to help him accomplish this by saying it is part of the plan to free Jaime. Varys is to put the thief, the poisoner, the mummer, and the murderer in crimson cloaks to join the rest of the guard escorting Cle Sir Cleos. Among 400 Lannister men cannot be watched closely. She will not like it and be uneasy, but Tyrion likes her uneasy. Sir Cleos leaves that afternoon escorted by a hundred Lannister guardsmen. That same afternoon, Tyrion finds Timid dicing in the barracks and tells him to meet him in his solar at midnight. He feasts with the Vale Mountain clans that night, shunning wine for once. During the feast, he asks Shaga what moon it is and is told black, which they call the traitor's moon. He tells Shaga not to get too drunk and to keep his axe sharp. Shaga uses axe to destroy the door to Pycelle's chamber. Tyrion has Timmet pull the naked serving girl out of the bed and march drag her into the hall. Tyrion pulls the blanket off the maester who asks why this is being done to a loyal servant. Tyrion tells him he sent one of his letters to Dorne Martell and the other to Cersei. Pycelle tries to blame Varys, but Tyrion informs him that he was the only one he entrusted the information with. Pycelle tries to claim that something happened to the letter on the way and that he knows things about Varys that would chill Tyrion's blood. Tyrion replies that his lady prefers his blood hot. Then Pycelle tries to accuse Littlefinger, to which Tyrion responds that he already knows about him. Tyrion instructs Shaga to cut off Pycelle's manhood and feed it to the goats. When Shaga states there are no goats, Tyrion tells him to make do. Shaga first takes most of Pycelle's beard with his axe, as Pycelle sprays everything in with urine. Pycelle tells Tyrion that he did everything for House Lannister and to ask Tywin. He says that he was even responsible for convincing Aerys the second Targaryen to open the gates. Tyrion Shock states, So the sack of King's Landing was your work as well? He then asks him how many has he betrayed? Aerys, Eddard Stark, himself, King Robert, John Arryn, Prince Rhaegar. Pycelle pleads that Robert was a wretched king that Renly was plotting to bring Mace Tyrell's daughter to court and have Cersei supplanted as queen. Tyrion asked what Lord Arryn had been plotting, and Pycelle explained that John Arryn knew of Cersei's incest. Pycelle also knew that Lord John planned to send his wife back to the Eyrie, his son to foster at Dragonstone, and that he meant to act on his knowledge. Thanks to Shaga's axe making closer and closer shaves of Pycelle's neck, Tyrion finally gets him to confess that he had a hand in the death of Jon Arryn by assuring he wouldn't receive effective treatment because he knew about the father of Cersei's children. He says that he knew that Cersei wanted Jon dead, but could not say it since Varys was always listening. He sent Coleman away because he was purging Jon. Then Pycelle attempts to blame Hugh for the poisoning, telling Tyrion that Varys can tell him. Disgusted, Tyrion orders Pycelle thrown into one of the black cells. When Pycelle is gone, Tyrion searches the quarters and collects a few more small jars, thinking how he wished Pycelle was the one he could have trusted. Varys and Littlefinger are no more loyal, just more subtle and thus more dangerous. Tyrion suspects his father's methods might be best. Send for Illin Payne, have all three of their heads mounted above the gates and be done with it. Well, that's it, everyone. 
Thank you so much for stopping by and watching my video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, please leave them down in the comments below. I will be doing a Q&A at the end of the month for the entire book. So please leave your questions down below so that I can compile them if you want them answered. Again, thank you so much for stopping by. Um, please give it a thumbs up if you liked it and please subscribe to come back for more. Thanks again. Bye.